I want to sacrifice more of my preferences as a white pastor. I need to grow in my laying aside of preferences for members of this body because I want Christ to be exalted through increasing diversity in our leadership and our membership. On a related note, like I do not want to speak from the Bible on issues that are popular among white followers of Christ while staying silent in the Bible on issues that are important to non-white followers of Christ. That is not faithful pastor. I actually read this week how studies have shown that white church leaders are less likely to speak and act prophetic, prophetically on race issues because white church leaders have more to lose when they do. Basically, if you want to draw a crowd in general, stay away from racial issues. If you want to draw a crowd of white people or, or black people or this type of person or that type of person, then stay away from saying any one of those types of people is part of the problem on racial issues. The reality is many people mainly want to be comforted when they come to church. And as people, we're, we're naturally drawn to that which brings the most benefit, most benefit with the least cost. So if you give people a choice between the church of comfort and the church of comfort, but you need to make sacrifices to change your life, people will choose the church of comfort most every time which is why we've designed so much of the church culture the way we have today. And it's why we're so prone not to talk about issues that are uncomfortable to us. And I just want us to see that the Bible doesn't give us that option. Like Amos 5 doesn't give us that option. We cannot truly worship God while we stay silent on injustice in all kinds of areas. And I know as a white pastor, I have blind spots. So I am part of the problem. I need friends and fellow pastors around me from different ethnicities who help me see those blind spots. And I'm, I'm committed to listening and learning and loving, laying aside whatever contemporary church growth methodology says is the best way to grow the church. I ignore the issues. I want us to do the exact opposite. I want us to hear God's word clearly on these issues. And then we can trust him with the growth of his church. All right. So, I, um, we'll, uh, we'll actually walk through that clip uh, <laughs> later on the episode, but for now, listeners, welcome to the 95 by Christo Ministries. I am Andrew Cannon, and I am here with my friend James Knapp, and we're going to, we're going to solve all the world's problems today. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we won't solve all the world's problems today. Uh, but I, I do want to want to talk about the idea of social justice and how it has now, I mean, manifest in the church. And this has been a few years in the making, as far as I can tell, as far as I can discern, a few years in the making. This woke language started being used. Um, it's it's not not recent. People were doing this, you know, three years ago. Uh, David Platt was doing this kind of stuff three years ago. It just now it has exploded in the church and so now it's noticeable and now we know what to call it, uh, social justice, woke church, hashtag woke church. So we're going to talk about this, the, the, the invasion of the church with the ideals of culture, namely this thing called social justice. Uh, from the outset, I just want to let our listeners know a couple things. First of all, uh, we do not judge a man based on one sermon. We're talking about the content of this sermon today. Uh, we do not judge a man based on one sermon. Uh, I, I am not the kind of person who throws around the term heretic. Uh, I, I reserve uh, the term heretic uh, for, for, for very special and very serious uh, occasions um, and, and very serious teachings. Um, I, I think social justice has infiltrated the church. Um, because it because it uses biblical language and an ideal that it uses an ideal that should be biblical uh, justice, um, but then kind of the ideals of the world and of culture masquerade under that term justice. So the church is is willing to accept that uh, it's and even um, guys like David Platt. I think I, I don't know that he's a heretic, but I do think that he is being fooled by by the world and by the by the ideals of the world and by culture. Um, so that being said, brother, what are your thoughts? Um, hopefully, our discussion today uh, helps Christians to think about the social justice movement as a whole. So, not thinking about one sermon, not picking on David Platt, but listening for what social justice teaching and woke teaching sounds like in the church so that we know what to avoid. That's, that's what I'm shooting for here. I want to yeah. treat this with, with as much grace as possible. 
Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, you know, we're not trying to pick on David Platt. David Platt has helped me in my walk with his book Radical and his secret churches. Mm. They've been yeah. uh, instrumental in my walk. But, uh, you know, because when I first saw this clip, I was like, man, this is just sad. Yeah. You know, and then, yeah, but then, because there's a Facebook group I follow, and they were talking about, and apparently, I guess, you know, they had two lists. Like, you know, they had the sound biblical teaching list, and then they have the non sound biblical teaching list. You know? Yeah. And David Platt was on the biblical teaching list along with some other guys. Mm-hmm. Then he did a revamp, he, and, we, and we noticed, I noticed some of the guys were gone, and someone commented, like, hey, how come these guys are gone? And the guy commented, well, they've gone woke. They've gone social justice. Yeah. Now, let me just say, I think racism is a sin. No doubt. That's right. Um, but to say everyone's a racist, as I say, everyone's a murderer or everyone's a thief. Um, everyone is a sinner. But you know, even those who are called, we're still sinners. We're just saved by grace. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, um, now, should we push for justice? Absolutely. If there is wrongdoing, yes, we should push for justice. I think scripture talks about that. But one day we will ultimately get justice when Christ returns and he will set everything right that was wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I yeah, think, the, you, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say this, the social justice issue now, um, if you if you haven't seen the controversy yet, I, I'd be really surprised if you don't know that this is a big controversy in the church. Um, the uh, From what I can tell, most of the young, restless, and reformed guys, um, so this would include Platt, and this would include guys like uh, Francis Chan and uh, and Matt Chandler and I, and I haven't seen much from Matt Chandler lately just because I haven't been following that um, but that that group of guys the young restless reformed guys uh, seem to be the guys who are getting most caught up in social justice and it's and it's young reformed guys young Calvinists who are getting caught up in this movement which is really surprising um, because uh, on one hand we we claim to believe in a sovereign God right. God is sovereign, it is God who works together all things. Um, but then it's like people are neglecting that and getting restless. So it's like we have no reason to be restless because we, because we rest in Christ and Christ is our, our Sabbath rest and he is the one in control and he is the one working all things together. So in a sense, like um, being restless about the way the world is and the way the church is doesn't make much sense. But people get restless about that uh, and and then uh, believe that it is a, it's upon them to change the whole church and upon them to change change the whole world mm-hmm. when really that is that is the work of Christ and then secondly this movement concerns me um, because it is seems seems to be prevalent in the Southern Baptist Convention and I pastor a Southern Baptist church I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church um, we we faithfully support our convention. Um, but with the Southern Baptist Convention two years ago, right, Resolution 9 was passed, which was about the, the use of uh, critical race theory and intersectionality, which are social justice terms. Yeah. Um, so this, this thing is very concerning to me. Um, I, we, need, we need to address this, and the church needs to address this. And, and I, I sincerely hope that this coming up convention this year that we renounce um, Resolution 9 and we repeal Resolution 9 in the Southern Baptist Convention um, because uh, I, I believe social justice, and I'll explain it as, as I kind of work through um, Platt's sermon, this particular sermon, right? Um, I, I, I believe it to itself be racist and to itself be sexist and to be, to be unjust, um, yeah. And that's, uh, I, I think that's serious because people are saying this is how we end justice, but, but then that the very movement is, is itself unjust. Uh, so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about biblical justice. Yeah. Uh, but before I, before I start walking through um, just the sermon and I took the time to go watch this whole sermon, it's about 45 minutes. You can find it pretty easily on, on YouTube. Yeah. I think there's uh, a link with that clip that we just saw. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we'll work through this clip again at that point in the sermon. That's toward the end of the sermon. This is toward the end of the sermon when he's making application. 
Uh, but do you, do you have any thoughts before I just I jump in and, and kind of walk through the sermon sermon progression? We won't watch the sermon here, listeners. Uh, feel free to look the sermon up on on your own and watch that. It would just take us too long to do that during a podcast episode. But do you have any comments before we just jump in? Yeah, um, I think racism is. I think you know there is talk about racial equality in the Bible. Um, I think of Ephesians two, Revelation nineteen seven. Or seven, nineteen, something like that. Which says, "All nations, all tribes, all tongues will come and confess that Jesus is Lord." Um, you know, and because, um, like, you know, like I said, I think it's just and the young reforming and the young restless and reform people are just jumping on this. Uh, I do have a question though. You think it's because of their eschatology? Maybe that's why they're pushing it. Because I know a lot of them are maybe post mail, and I know post mail deals with. They said they're the ones who are out there saying we are the ones who need to conform justice. Yeah, I, I wrote an article on my blog um, not too long ago about the different millennial positions. And uh, I mentioned on that blog that uh, the post mill position uh, seems to be being misapplied today uh, mm-hmm. in favor of the social justice movement. I think that could be part of it. But yeah. I, I think it's I think it's a blatant misapplication of the post mill position. But yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah I think it's part of it. Yeah, I had to do because I know there are some great post mill teachers out there, mm-hmm. and um, I think I think you know Dr. James White even came out as a post mill recently. So yeah, he did. Yeah, and uh, Greg Bonson uh, post mill, mm-hmm. and he would never get into something as as terrible as social no. justice in the woke. No, Greg Bonson, that's a guy I've been mean to read. I just haven't yet. Yeah, I, I highly recommend it, bro. It's, okay. it's good. Uh, and a, and yeah. a great presuppositional well, apologist too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I know on uh, on my group, the group that we follow, the apologetics group, he he's mentioned as like almost every other topic. Like you know, Bonson said this, Bonson said that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I highly recommend Bonson. All right, well, yeah. Let's get let's get into it. All right. So uh, David Platt uh, begins his sermon by basically uh, affirming sola scriptura, which is good. It's good that he affirms sola scriptura. Uh, Sola scriptura is a doctrine that scripture is both authoritative and sufficient. So scripture is the authority by which we do all things, uh, by the law of the Lord, and it is sufficient for all of life and ministry. Uh, Only after making that claim, he gets into a sermon and he starts teaching something other than scripture, which means he, he has confessed it for this particular sermon, confessed sola scriptura, but then preaches a sermon in a way that does not uh, apply sola scriptura to the sermon itself, um, which is an interesting uh, line here. Uh, He's preaching from Amos chapter uh, Mm 5, verses 21 through 24. Uh, Let me just read this for you. Uh, Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies, Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, and I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps, but let justice, and here's where uh, David launches from, right? But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Now there, um, Amos has not defined justice and that particular pericope, right? Uh, So David launches off that, defines justice for himself instead of looking for a a biblical definition of justice and what justice is. David applies his, his own, um, his own definition to just, and this just happens to be a cultural definition, not a biblical definition definition of of justice. So justice is a very real biblical idea. We read it there in in Amos, right? Pursue justice, be a just people, uh, make sure justice rules in in the land. This is how you live for the Lord. If you are not seeking justice, if you are not being a just people, God does not favor your sacrifices. Uh, He does not like your worship. If you are offering him lip service, but not living it out, not being a just people, only seeking to be justified by some sort of religiosity. David makes that point, and it's a very good point, a biblical point. That point needs to be made. Only then David changes his language. Uh, He introduces a modern social justice movement language in order to define justice. So he 
he defines justice as racial equity. Um, I was re- uh, listening to a sermon by, by Vody Bauckham recently, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he describes the difference between equality and equity, right? These are two different things. So equality offers equal opportunity, right? Equal opportunity, equal opportunity, equal opportunity. People still have to work for it, right? Equity, uh, on the other hand, says, hey, uh, we need, so for instance, at, at a university, at a school, we need to be graduating just as many Asians as we are African Americans as we are white people. We need to be graduating that. If we're not graduating just as many uh, or the same number in, in, in ratio, right, exponentially, the same number of people coming out, um, then then we don't have equity here. Uh, that is that is racialization. That is that is unjust. Here's a problem with that: is that all of a sudden you're forced to um, promote people based on the color of their skin rather than the content of their character, or rather than their willingness to work hard, or rather than their intelligence, or rather than their ability to write and take tests. Um, so instead of people earning what they get, now it's being handed to them based on the color of their skin or withheld from them based on the color of their skin. So, so that's the danger of social justice. That's what social justice does. It is about equity rather than equality. Um, we need to know, and maybe we can take time right now to talk about this. What is the biblical view of justice? How does the Bible actually define justice? The justice that David Platt should be talking about, how, how does the Bible actually define that? Well, you know, doing what is right is right, what is wrong is wrong, uh, reaping what you sow and all that kind of sense. Mm. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's been a while since I've looked up a dictionary term, but <laughs> I yeah. think God, but yeah, I will say it's, it's something like that, you know, because when Christ returns, everything that is opposed against him is going to be gone. Yeah. Um, that's a true fact. You know, that's a statement. Um but I think justice, biblical justice, is, you know, pretty much like the Old Testament law, the saying, you know, hey, you did this, so you're going to get this in return. Yeah. It's not karma, which a lot of people believe these days, you know. <laughs> yeah, even Christians karma, believe. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even Christians avoid karma, or even Christians believe in karma some, someday. Yeah. But. Yeah. So as I, as I was listening to Platt's sermon, uh, I... I decided to do an experiment. I was like, okay, uh, let's try to practice a, a good hermeneutic here. Uh, and a good hermeneutic is, is what? Well, if Amos in chapter five is talking about justice, well, you look at, you, you read chapters one, two, three, and four uh, to figure out uh, what Amos is describing as justice or injustice, right? And so I, I read Amos one through four leading up to this passage in Amos chapter five that David uh, is, is, I'll say at this point, um, pretending to preach from, because he's not preaching the Bible, he's, he's using the Bible, he's appropriating the Bible, which is unfortunate. Uh, Amos chapter 1, verse 3, uh, describes injustice this way. For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. And so they went to war against a nation, uh, against, against which... It, it didn't need to go to war. So unjust war, um, persecuting a people that did not deserve to be persecuted, did not deserve to be oppressed. And so that sort of oppression, um, waging war against people um, who do not, have not earned a war, right? Uh, That is unjust, according to Amos. That's part of the injustice Amos is uh, arguing against, uh, getting on to the nations for. And Amos chapter one, verse six, He says, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke its punishment because they deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. Now, this is interesting. Uh, Deporting the ethnic group from its homeland and uh, forcing integration with another people. This is unjust, unjust, according to Amos. Uh, which means all of this talk about forcing integration, this is equity, right? About forcing integration, uh, deporting certain ethnic groups, certain cultural groups from uh, their 
distinctness and forcing them to be integrated with another people, biblically, this is actually an unjust thing, according to Amos. And so the thing that David Platt is arguing for, which we'll see as I continue to summarize his sermon moving through this, the very thing David Platt is arguing for is the thing that is unjust according to Amos, yet he's teaching from Amos and he, he just missed this entirely. Why? He's not practicing healthy hermeneutic. Uh, he is not using the Bible to interpret the Bible. He is forgetting context altogether, which means his at the beginning of a sermon when he said, uh, scripture alone, we want to know what the Bible teaches. He hasn't actually looked at what the Bible teaches. He's appropriating that because he's teaching exactly the opposite. And Amos chapter four, verse one, Amos says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, <laughs> who, are, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, and who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. And so injustice there is oppressing the poor. It's not making sure that no one is poor. It's not making sure everybody has the same income. Uh, it's not creating equity. Instead, it is not oppressing the poor, not taking advantage of the poor, not crushing the needy, not demanding things from, from people. Uh, that is in unjust. That is injustice. Uh, so um, this, this problem of injustice, according to the Bible, it's not about equity, but it is about unjust oppression. Stop oppressing people unjustly, right? Mm -hmm. And in Amos chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor, oppressing the poor, and exact a tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-known stone, well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. Uh, so reproving those who have done no wrong, which is bearing false witness. So bearing false witness is unjust. Calling a white person a racist, even if that white person is not a racist, just because he is white, that is bearing false witness. That is unjust. Abhorring those who present accurate testimony uh, is unjust. Uh, and taking advantage of the poor, uh, not Again, it's not, not against having poor people, but against oppressing the poor. So justice in the Bible is, is not about equity at all. It, it is about equality, equal worth, uh, equal opportunity, right? It's not about equity. It's about equality. Yeah. And uh, today we need to realize that we cannot pursue both equity and equality at the same time, right? Because the two are the two are different. And if our objective is equity, then we will create inequality across the board because we will begin giving people opportunities. And we've already started doing this, right? That's what social justice is about. We will give people opportunities based on their minority status, based on the color of their skin, based on how they identify sexually, uh, based, on, based, on, based on gender, um, and that's where we get uh, critical race theory and intersectionality. That's what those things are. Um, so this is, this is a movement that creates inequality for the sake of, of equity, uh, for the sake of uh, consequences, what comes out on the other side. We are worshiping our statistics, how many black people are making it through the system, right? And how many um, minorities are making it through the system. And, oh, look, the, the first... Um, the first woman vice president, and oh, look, the first black vice president. And those are the things we celebrate rather than hard work, rather than, um, rather than real, like, right, like social ethic, rather than loving one another. Instead, we're just worshiping the consequences, which makes us a consequentialist nation and social justice, this thing, it's being touted as something good, but it is really in itself unjust. Um, we are saying to ourselves, the ends justify the means. So we oppress the right group of people so that equity on the other side, things are equitable on the other side. Um, but in reality, what we're doing is we are, we are canceling equality, uh, which is a very dangerous move. So that's 
what justice is according to the Bible and why social justice, the modern social justice movement is completely opposed to scripture. Yeah. Right on brother. Um, you know, it's funny because here in verse seven, on Amos five, it says for those who turn justice into warm word and cast righteousness down the earth. Mm-hmm. I think that's what's happening. There's, they're taking what justice is supposed to be. They're turning it into warm wood, which is kind of like hot or cold, just right yeah, in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and that's, we've redefined justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, to mean injustice, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we've taken the justice of God, real justice, and turning it to w- wormwood just means now as, as, a, as a nation and, and the movements, our culture, what we get involved in, um, we've poisoned that. We've poisoned real justice so that justice no longer exists. Um, and that's exactly what Amos was getting on to people for doing. So, so David, uh, David Platt, he needs to actually read the book of Amos. He needs to go and understand these things because yeah. it's talking about him and what he is doing. Um, yeah. And that's uh, a t- perverting justice, turning it into yeah. wormwood. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a dangerous thing to use the word of God to promote your own selfish, selfish agenda. Yes, it is. I think MacArthur, when, when Biden went swore in, he used to have the Bible, MacArthur mm-hmm. said, you know, be careful you place a hand in the God and then because we know what Biden stands for. He's for promote promote me for aborting babies and homosexual marriage and all that, which the Bible condemns. Yeah. But um um, you know, we uh we because I because MacArthur in his book A Shame of the Gospel, when the when the world becomes like the church when the church becomes like the world. Yeah. Which great book, which I reckon I would highly recommend reading, especially in times. Talking, he's talking about what Spurgeon dealt with, and the I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a downplay movement. Yeah, yeah, the downgrade controversy. Downgrade, yeah, thank you. Um, basically, saying, you know, people shouldn't don't want intellectual sermons anymore. They want these fun, energetic dramas and all the preaching and all that, and that leads into stuff like this. You know, because yeah. instead of saying what does the church need. They're saying, what does the world want? Yeah. Well, the, the whole thing is like the whole reason we're in this mess is because a couple generations ago, the gospel, the, the, a whole generation dumbed down the gospel, stopped teaching doctrine, started trying to meet the preferences of youth and, and Sunday school and youth ministry. Uh, and the gospel was dumbed down and uh, people started perpetuating a dumbed down gospel. People, people, forgot the, the great historic doctrines of the faith. I mean, just look at the Southern Baptist Convention, right? Where did we start? With the 1689 London Baptist Confession, and now we have the, the, the 2000 BF&M, which is, which is a joke. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. That's what it is. And it's, it's like this dumbing down of doctrine and dumbing down of scripture and lack of intellect and knowledge in the church and lack of lack of manly, godly leadership in the church, that's led to where we are today. Yeah, Steve Austin said it best when when he, he played a, a clip of Joel Steen saying he's not sure what is a sin or what, or if, it's been namely if homosexual is a sin. And Joel Steen did the whole, well, I don't know. I can't judge him. I can't judge the opinion <laughs> and all that. See, Lawson was like, "No, well, give us, well, give us someone who does know the truth. Give yeah. us men who will stand up for that. For that, you know, it's a, you know, it's one thing to preach out of the Bible. It's another thing to preach the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one one thing to use Scripture. Another thing to teach Scripture. Yeah, uh, it's one thing to apply Scripture. It's another thing to appropriate Scripture. Yeah. And unfortunately, with David Platt, what we see is a twist in this sermon. And I need to clarify: in this sermon, yeah. what we see is a twisting of Scripture and an appropriation of Scripture, rather than an exposition of Scripture and an and an application, a right application of yeah. That Scripture. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I think it comes back back to what are you trying to get at? Are you trying to reach people with the lost, the great message that is Jesus Christ? Yeah. Or you just want to say, well, I want to get people on the pulpits or on the seats. So I'm going to preach this message about social justice. Or I'm going to have a female pastor teach about why homosexuality is not a sin no more or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, so David Platt, 
uh, he, he reads the scripture and Amos sees Amos use justice. And then he redefines Amos term, Amos's term, uses it in a way that Amos does not use it. And then he bases the rest of his uh, sermon on a uh, misidentification of justice, uh, on a on a reinterpretation, on a, on a redefining of Amos's uh, version of, of justice and of God's description of, of justice and what biblical justice is. He redefines justice as racial equity. Uh, he conflates justice with non-distinction, which is really interesting. He uses a term called racialization. Um, like, it's, like it's a bad thing, like it's a bad thing that that there are distinct cultures who worship distinctly and separately from, from other cultures, even though we're worshiping the same guy. He talks about that like it's a bad thing, uh, but he's not able to articulate why that's necessarily a bad, a bad thing. Um, Platt's sermon reflects uh, cancel culture um, because of non-distinction, right? He's wanting to cancel dividing lines uh, between cultures so that essentially you're integrating, forcing integration between cultures, which, uh, and according to his own words in his sermon, um, kind of conflates those different cultures together and those different cultures start to reflect a single culture. Uh, here, I would just like to say, cancel culture cancels culture. <laughs> it is, that is not a good way to respect the heritage of any person or the, or the culture of any person. If we love culture, we do respect those distinctions, and it's okay to allow for a black church to be a black church and a cowboy church to be a cowboy church, right? Uh, it's, it's okay to allow for that because we want to respect heritage and we want to respect culture and we love different cultures and we want those cultures to continue to, to exist and persist and, 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 and for our children and grandchildren to be able to experience those same cultures. If we integrate everything, eventually everything becomes the same culture, which is cancel culture. That's what cancel culture yeah. teaches. Um, and then he wants to... Uh, also, like measure people according to the color of their skin, uh, which itself is racism, right? And there's a contradiction here because on 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 one side he's talking about non-distinction, bringing cultures together and integrating cultures, and then in another place he's like, "But we need to measure people by the color of their skin." And then he like brags about doing it at his own church, like we have we have pastors who are black and and Asian, and and we have a multi-ethnic pastoral staff, which which is great, right? That's yeah. fine. That's great, yeah. Yeah. That's great if, if you're doing it for the right reasons. Right, for the right reasons. And if you're not like promoting people based on the color of their skin, because that is racism. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, that means you're rejecting somebody because of the color of his or her skin, right? That is racism. That is discrimination. First of all, it's against the law in America. Second of all, it's that is unjust. And then you brag about it like, yeah, that's, yeah, we're, mul we're multi-ethnic. And all of a sudden you're making your church about you rather than about Christ. And, and this yeah. is the pattern that we see throughout his sermon. Um, those are the contradictions that we hear throughout his sermon, uh, the incoherence in his sermon. Mm -hmm. um, so David Platt from the pulpit, and then after I say this, we'll talk about this clip and we'll actually walk through the clip and we'll pause it and make comments on it. Um, but, uh, but David Platt is from the pulpit. He is preaching racism, teaching racism to his congregation, uh, preaching injustice, teaching injustice to his congregation, encouraging, exhorting his congregation to be unjust as they interact in the world and with the world. Um, if I am to place a term on this sermon, it is going to be, uh, if, if I were to title <laughs> David Blatt's sermon, it would be The New Jim Crow. <laughs> that's, that's what I would title the sermon, because while, while the Jim Crow laws essentially forced segregation, right, um, The New Jim Crow is forcing integration such that it cancels the culture of entire people groups. Who suffers as a result of forced integration? Minorities do, mm -hmm. right? Which culture is going to be the culture to disappear and be lost to history? Well, it's going to be the culture of the minorities. Um, so, so this is this whole movement is not helping minorities at all. Um, it is it is a 
it's a battle against minorities, uh, which is sad. It's like we're undoing all the progress we've made as a nation. Uh, we came so far that now people are like, oh, let's undo all that. Let's, let's take our country back 200 years. Um, and y'all, this is, you need to listen to me, right? I'm, I'm going to use your argument against you. This is the 21st century. You need to get with the time. Stop trying to take us back 200 years and undoing all yeah. the progress that we've done. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I got friends who are multi-ethnic. I had to choose them because based on their skin, because I got to know them and they're great people. Yeah. yeah. You know, and my, like, like I'm, I mentioned to you before the show, my best friend is married to an African-American woman. I'm for that. I think that's great. I know. Uh, I read John, P- John Piper's Bloodlines. A really great book. Yeah. I recommend reading that. For sure. So, yeah, but, you know, because I think we kind of get caught up of, well, because yeah, you kind of said it, I'm going to kind of go off on it. It's kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, that church is the black church. That's the Mexican church. That's the white church. That's as bad as we do. As a Presbyterian, that's reform. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, when when it, when when it, when Christ comes, or when we get into heaven, there's not going to be a white heaven, a black heaven, a kitten and all this. Right. You know, because here here he says in Revelation Revelation seven nine, after these things, we talking about the seals and there's an the interlude, the hundred four four thousand and all that. I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one account, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, "Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb." There's that is that's right there is is, is what true equality is. Mm-hmm. That we're all going to be before God, and God's not going to be like, well. Well, I'll be God for just these certain group of people. No, it, he's God to everybody. So, yeah, yeah and and we are together. Um, I think I think Platt um, took a misstep when he when he started talking about how um, distinctions necessarily meant division, right? And so mm-hmm. so he talks about how um, uh, the, you know. Uh, segregation and it's not a forced segregation uh, one group doesn't hate another group right um, but he started talking about how the fact that we have the black church meeting over there and the white church meeting over the you know um, and he started calling that division it's like that's that's not division distinction is not synonymous with division uh, do not conflate the two right yeah. um, I I right now am I'm separated from my family in Oklahoma I'm in Arizona uh, my my family, my mom, my my stepdad, um, uh, my brother, my my sister. They're in Ari- They're in Oklahoma, and I'm in Arizona. I'm separated from them, but we're not divided. I wouldn't say we're divided. So just because you have Christians meeting in separate buildings um, and Christians with with different, distinct cultural paradigms. That, that does not necessitate division. And I think David Platt is seeing division where there is not division, right? Now, sure, there's division there. Um, I, I'm divided with, with David Platt on this point of social justice. There's division. But I still recognize him as a Christian brother. I want to speak reasonably into this. I don't hate him. So even division doesn't necessitate hate. So I think he's conflating all of these things that don't need to be conflated. And that makes it impossible for anybody to grow. Um, and that makes it impossible for us to honor any cultural paradigm. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, scripture talks about divisions in churches not be some skin because of the theology. Mm-hmm. All in Corinthians deals with that. That's right. You know, and he's like, some are saying, well, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul. And there's the super group, then the super ones, you know, I am of Christ. Yeah. And Paul's like, no, we're, we're all one. We're, we, we were one because of, because of Christ. So, yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's get through this clip and then, uh, then we'll make any further comments that need to be made after right. this. Yeah. Let me make sure everybody can see this. All right. You can see I'll, it. I'll, 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 real quick. I love the face. You be paused at. Yeah. More of my preferences as a white pastor, I need to grow. And my 
laying aside of preferences for members of this body because I want Christ to be exalted through increasing diversity in our leadership and our membership. On a related note, like I do not want to speak from the Bible on issues that are popular among white followers of Christ while staying silent in the Bible on issues that are important to non-white followers of Christ. That's not- All right, let's talk about that. <laughs> that statement. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so, and, I, and I noticed this throughout his sermon, right? Um, he, he, he was concerned about um, speaking on issues that appealed to people rather than simply preaching the Bible. And so, he, so he's concerned about speaking on issues that are important to certain demographics, right? Mm-hmm. But then completely absent from his entire sermon is speaking on matters that God wants him to speak about. Um, and even at the beginning of a sermon, he said, uh, I, I feel God leading me to address this topic. Uh-oh. No, 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 David uh-huh. Platt, please. God's not God, a feeling. God has instructed preachers to preach the gospel, the person and work of Jesus Christ, not to speak racialization, not to speak integration, not to speak on cultural ideals, but to simply exposit his word and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. David Platt, for being so concerned about the gospel, the gospel was completely absent from your sermon. It was all about our work and how we can become righteous, which which is the anti-gospel. Please repent for this sermon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, no, the way he says it there, you know, I don't want to preach, I don't want to you preach the Bible that's not what, how do you say it? Do you remember? I mean, that clip, I can't remember how exactly, but it was like, I don't want to preach the Bible on non biblical issues. Mm, yeah. So, what are you going to use? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I don't, he doesn't want to preach from the Bible on issues that only matter to white people. It's, well, look, you are an ambassador for Christ not for white people or black people or Asian people or, or any, you are an ambassador for Christ. You speak his words and the Holy spirit will convict people according to the Holy spirit's will. Yeah. You speak the words of, of God, not the words of men. Yeah, I, want, I, want, I, want, I, want, I wonder what Paul would have said if he, if he was preaching and if he, he was, would, in he would have wrote the, the, uh, the, the first epistle to the Corinthians again. <laughs> yeah. He would have. Yeah. Yeah, All right, so. let's, see what yeah. else. let's see what else we hear here. Not faithful pastoring. I actually read this week. Yeah, actually faithful pastoring would just be expositing the, the word of God. That's, yeah. That would so. How studies have shown that white church leaders are less likely to speak and act prophetic, prophetically on race issues because white church leaders have more to lose when they do. Basically, if you want to draw a crowd in general, stay away from racial issues. If you want to draw a crowd of white people or, or black people or this type of person or that type of person, then stay away from saying any one of those types of people is part of the problem on racial issues. Because the reality is many people mainly want to be comforted when they come to church. And as people, we're, we're naturally drawn to that which brings the most benefit, most benefit with the least cost. So if you give people a choice between the church of comfort and the church of comfort, but you need to make sacrifices to change your life, people will choose the church of comfort most every time which is why we've designed so much of the church culture the way we have today. And it's why we're so prone not to talk about issues that are uncomfortable to us. And I just want to see that the Bible doesn't give us that option. Like Amos 5 doesn't give us that option. We cannot truly worship God. All right. He makes a solid point there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for humanists. Yeah. Well, no, the, the solid point is this. Like, um, we shouldn't dance around uncomfortable issues. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Of course. Of course, if, if we're preaching expositorily and, and preaching as we should, uh, ha- having as our normative method, uh, Lectio Continua, uh, walking yeah. through books of the Bible and getting the full counsel of Scripture, we're going yeah. to have to address some really uncomfortable topics for us. Yeah. But that should be the basis on which we teach. Now, what David Platt is doing here is he's jumping onto a cultural bandwagon, the social justice movement, and he's preaching something that uh, that people want to hear about. So even according to his own standard here, he's saying we must preach about the difficult topics and the topics that nobody wants to address during a time when 
this right here is what everybody is saying. And actually the uncomfortable thing to do is speak against it and to do what is biblical. And so David Platt is doing exactly what he's telling people not to do. This, uh, yeah. yeah, do what he says here, but don't do what he does. It's, it's, yeah, do what he says. But yeah, I agree in the sense how people won't be comforted. And I, I yeah, I, yeah. Sometimes we get, that's what, that's what everything called comfort zones. Mm-hmm. I, remember, I remember when I was at Emmaus, I met a guy named Alex Strott. Yeah. The church fellowship. That, the word comfort zone was not in his dictionary. Right. Right. He got right in your grill and was like, hey, so where are you I, from? What, what? I, I, I have no idea what a comfort zone is since I started following Christ. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, I still, I still have my comfort zone, but it's gotten, I guess, smaller or broader. I don't know which way is good. But, but yeah, but you know, um, I think of guys like the champions of the faith, like the Puritans, the reformers, even today, MacArthur, Sproul, Lawson. Yeah. They, they preached expository, and when the when when the difficult searches came up, like homosexuality, women pastors, abortion, racism, the critical race theory, now what their go to was what does scripture say about that? Here he's like he's saying I'm gonna be advised by scripture, but I got my own thoughts. What I'm gonna say? Yeah. Yeah, crit- critical race theory is the new racism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I think I think I think Platt and Gaudi should have a debate. Think who now? The Platt and uh, Vaudi. Uh, yeah, Platt doesn't stand a chance, man. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right. be fun to not, not, many, not many people stand a chance against Bacham. So <laughs> no, that's true. All right. so on injustice in all kinds of areas. And I know as a white pastor, I have blind spots. So I am part of the problem. I need friends and fellow pastors around me from different ethnicities who help me see those blind spots. And I'm, I'm committed to listening and learning and loving, laying aside whatever contemporary church growth methodology says is the best way to grow the church. I ignore the issues. I want us to do the exact opposite. I want us to hear God's word clearly on these issues, and then we can trust him. Oh, I mean, a lot right there, but yeah, uh, Brad he said he needs friends, family, and other pastors of different of, of different races so he can help see them last month. So, you, are you telling me you're going to step step before like a council, preach your message, and have every single race say, "Well, it didn't please the black, the African Americans, didn't please the Asians, yeah. didn't please the Native Americans, didn't please to this." Right. How yeah, long this- before you do that? Before you say, "Well, I need people of other religions." Just um, tell me what's good in my sermon. Yeah. yeah, it is It is really interesting that he wants to base his sermon. After talking about how everybody needs to lay their preferences aside, then he talks about how he ha- how he wants to meet everybody's preferences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just the, that incoherency uh, throughout this sermon. And then also, like, you really feel that way, then you... You have no business being in the pulpit because you're because of your whiteness. Instead, yeah. give, give it to somebody. Instead, the only person who should ever fill a pulpit is someone who is is every single race all at the same time, um, according to these standards. Which you can't do that. I should say ethnicity uh, or or, yeah. or cultural, you know, yeah. socio cultural um, identity, or has has every socio cultural uh, religious. Uh, ethnic uh, identity all at the same time. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy. Yeah. And I, I love how in this little, little clip, he keeps saying me as a white pastor, not as a Christian, but as a white pastor. He yeah. keeps saying that. It's like, dude, that, if that's your identity, then you have lost the God. You've lost the gospel message. Right. Yeah, the, the gospel Christ defeats me. that. Yeah. That's not like your identity if, no more. If he was going to be preaching the gospel or if he was preaching the gospel, here's, here's how it would sound. We all deserve death because we are unjust. That was God's message to Amos. We are unjust people Mm -hmm. and we perpetuate injustice. Uh, We are depraved and we live in a wretched world and we are all going to hell. But Jesus came and Jesus died for the sins of his elect. And if we are in Christ, we give up every single other identity and we identify ourselves with Christ rather than according to the ways of the world. That's the gospel. That's the person and work of Jesus. Yeah. And Platt just missed it. Yeah, I, I, I said in my podcast, if you get the gospel message wrong, you get a lot of things wrong too. 
everything wrong. And the thing is, yeah. Platt used to be, he used to be so passionate about the gospel. Now he's just passionate about worldly culture. Yeah. At least yeah. in this, you know. I, I think he needs to read some Bach home. He needs to read MacArthur's A Shame of the Gospel, Piper's Bloodlines. Or just the uh, Bible. Or the Bible and the Bible too. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, if he was truly concerned about his, had a, him being a problem of a white pastor, he needs to step down and let and let a, and let an African or an Asian take over his church. That's it. If he's Plain be, simple. If if he's going to live what he preaches, that's what happens. Yeah. yeah um, which he is sad, I don't I don't think that needs to happen. Um, no, he, I, no. I don't, he I don't, hasn't been disqualified yet. He's. No, I don't. I don't think it's a sin to be white or black or any any other color. I no. don't think it's a sin to wear glasses or not. I, I don't think. No. I don't think it's a sin to have red facial hair, even though it technically means I'm Scottish or Irish. You know, and no. <laughs> even, no. even though it makes me a ginger. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, um, it's sad he went down this route. Um, hopefully, he doesn't continue down this route. Right. But if he does, then yeah, that's he needs to repent big time. So. Um, to our listeners, let me just make a couple of warnings. A sermon like this, uh, this is the danger of topical sermons rather than expository sermons. Uh, now, you can do a topical sermon in an expository way, right? You yes. exposit the text. But if you take a topic and then you go to find a, a chapter in Scripture or a verse in Scripture that you can that you can appropriate to fit your topic or your opinions about a topic or a cultural ideal, uh, you're going to present a false gospel just like Platt did, whether on purpose or on accident. So we preach expositorily. Um, secondly, we don't, we don't use the Bible to support cultural norms. Um, no, we teach the Bible and we make, a, we make correct applications where appropriate, but our objective is to teach the Bible, not a cultural idea. Um, we don't forsake the gospel, um, which is the person and work of Jesus. Platt totally forsook the gospel in this sermon. He wasn't talking about the person and work of Jesus. Instead, he was trying to tell people how they need to become righteous. He totally forgot about forgiveness, totally forgot about the fact that uh, Jesus separates uh, us from our sin as far as the East is from the West, totally forgot about atoning sacrifice, so totally forgot about redemption totally forgot about regeneration, totally forgot about people being a new creation in Christ. And just, he threw all that out the window because he jumped onto a cultural bandwagon. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of good things I heard in the sermon, and uh, I'm not going to be critical of anyone um, without also saying what I saw that was really good in the sermon. Uh, he said uh, that we need to uh, listen to one another. We need to get around the table uh, with people who are different than we are, uh, and we do need to strive to understand other, other cultures, and we do need to strive to understand where other people are coming from. We do need to learn from one another and listen to one another and love one another sincerely. Uh, those are good things. Platt said that, even though he, he got off base uh, with those sorts of ideals in, in most of his sermon. But he did say those things, and those are good things. Uh, we do need to be interested in building bridges. We need to be interested in racial equality, um, but social justice, uh, it, it, prevents social, it prevents racial equality. And so social yes. justice is the poison here. It is the wormwood uh, that people have, have twisted justice to be. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, is, well, what do you think? Is that it, or we need to say something else? <laughs> I think that's it. Um, I think we hit everything we got. Um, like I said, ho hopefully, you know, don't let us influence your view of David Black. Listen to your sermon, the sermon yourself, and make it your own. Your own call. Yeah. 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 Be Berean. Uh, compare everything you hear to scripture. Uh, yeah. Scripture alone, right? So I have people criticize my sermons, right? Um, but usually somebody who is criticizing a sermon, they're like, oh, I don't feel like things are that way. And, and oh, you're just young, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, no, actually take it to the scriptures, actually look at the scriptures, actually investigate. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you are seeking confirmation rather than understanding, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so go to the scriptures. Uh, the scriptures are our authority. Scripture alone, solo scriptura. That's what the reformers died for. The Puritans died for. That's why a lot of missionaries are dying for. And that's the uh, principle by which Martin Luther King Jr. operated. So in this sermon that we watched by by uh, 
by David Platt. He claimed to be arguing in favor of the same things that uh, Reverend King uh, was arguing for in his own day, in his own social justice. Here's the difference. David Platt is arguing that people be judged by the color of their skin. MLK Jr. was arguing that his children not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So the social justice movement raises up Dr. King as their influence, uh, but it's doing exactly the opposite thing that, that he did. Uh, we do not judge people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character and by no. their work ethic uh, and, and by, um, by their identity in, in Christ. Uh, nothing else. Um, so any movement that says, yep, exalt people or oppress people based on the color of their skin, that is pure evil, pure evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right. This has been the 95 by Christoa Ministries. Don't be too harsh, please, after, after this one. This has been the 95 by Christoa Ministries. Please uh, check us out at Christoa.com, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-A.com. Check out the missions work we are involved in. Check out the resources there on the, on the blog for you. And please consider donating uh, after you have uh, prayed for everything that we are doing. James, would you like to share the information about your other podcast? Yes, it's called Truth For You. It's found on Anchor, Spotify, Google, Apple, wherever you get podcasts at. Uh, we're walking through the book of Romans. Last week we talked about the we talked about the wrath of God, and this week we're, we're, it's coming out. It's going to come out tonight. We're going to, we're going to look at what happens when it's too late. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you again for joining us. We will catch you next time.